Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Hare Krishna Project podcast. This is episode number 110. A big thank you to everyone who continues to tune in from all over the world. We have a very supportive, and I'm very grateful for that support, a very supportive global audience. Uh, do not forget, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, to hit the subscribe button, if you haven't already, so you can be kept updated about future podcasts and video productions from the Harry Krishna Project. Uh, and of course, if you're watching this on Facebook, to kind of do the same. I would really like it if you liked and or followed the Harry Crystal Project Facebook page so you can be kept updated about future podcasts and other things we're doing here at the Harry Krishna Project. As you know, we don't just produce podcasts. We also do book distribution, school programs, Harry Krishna festivals, things that keep me out of trouble and keep me busy. <laughs> um, OK, fantastic. Let's kick off with episode 110. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our guest this week. It's Kakudmi Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank Hare you so Krishna much. Prabhu. It's great to have you with us. Um, one of the things I'm loving about my own podcast is I'm getting to meet all these people from all over the world that I, I wouldn't have ever met otherwise. So um, Without having to go to India. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Zoom and the internet, it's just like, it's changed the world, isn't it? You know, yes. um, which is for, in, in a positive way. Um, okay, so... Kukudmi Prabhu, we're going to start with the first question. It's the nice, easy question that every guest gets first. It is, please tell us a bit about you and where you are from. Yes, Hare Krishna. My name is Kukudmi Das. My uh, Karmi name is Christian Kolega, and I am from Croatia. I was born there in the city of Zadar on the coastline, and I lived there until I was 18. And then I moved to Rijeka for, um, to go to college. And there I met devotees and I quit college. I dropped out and I joined the Hare Krishna temple. That's a very brief uh, sort of half of my <laughs> life. Um, yeah, I grew up in Zadar, pretty much normal childhood, very happy ch childhood. And uh, I went to music school for a while for accordion didn't like it very much and then uh, quit that and took up my father's guitar. He taught me how to tune it and then I started playing rock music, which I started listening at the time. Uh, rock and heavy metal music, uh, which actually, you know, in ret retrospective, <clears throat> I can see how that music, uh, more lyrics than music, turned me into mystical, you know, desire for mystical experiences and the idea of karma and reincarnation was kind of imprinted in my mind without knowing about it, you know, listening to Iron Maiden and some other bands that uh, that uh, sort of dabbed into those my mystical uh, themes. And um, <clears throat> I loved the music, so I did read the, li the, the lyrics and I uh, sort of uh, developed an interest without even knowing about it. But then the war happened in Croatia, so everything got put on hold. I was 16 when it started, so, you know, kind of the best years of your youth. I uh, got spoiled by uh, the most horrific experience uh, that anyone can uh, experience in their lifetime. So that was for about three years I was there, and uh, the, the worst part of it. And Zadar was also hit pretty bad, uh, the three uh, worst. Uh, uh, the, the, the three worst hit cities in Croatia, one of them is Zadar. And uh, so I did, at, at that time, actually a, right before the war, uh, when my high school started, a couple of devotees came to my high school and tried to sell some books. So they presented it as, as mystical, India, yogis, pyramids, something. I, I heard those words, you know, those keywords that made me like, oh, that, that's interesting. Let's read that through the summer. So they suggested very clever Sankirtan uh, technique is like, well, you don't have to just buy one book. You can buy two books, you know, two people buy two books and then re you just exchange them when you read them. You buy one book, but you actually read two books. So we're like, oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> 
So we bought two books, friend and I, and it was uh, perfect questions, perfect answers, and signs of self-realization. And life comes from life was another book that was sold in mass in Croatia. So we took those two books, and he said, "Which one do you want to read first? I'm like, "I'll take the smaller one." <laughs> so perfect answers, you know, perfect questions, perfect answers. So I took that book, I read it completely, and the only thing I I remembered from it is that I really liked it. I couldn't remember anything, like n the content, what he was talking about, just that I really liked it. And I remembered constantly the word Prahu Baha, which was Prabhupada. <laughs> but I remembered it as Prahu Baha, so something, you know, Maha Baha Raha. But I couldn't remember the word Hare Krishna. Never, never. I mean, I read it so many times, I just didn't pick it up. I didn't think there was something important. There were so many you know, strange names that I, I, I actually read Prabhupada's book and I couldn't remember the name Krishna at all. So then um, that was right before the war. So the whole war, nothing, no mention of Krishna, nothing. I, I never heard of it. And then I went to Rijeka, um, the, the town that was spared by the war. There was no war there. In, in some parts of Croatia, there was not one bullet not one grenade, just refugees and sort of normal life. So Rijeka was one of those um, college city. So I went there just to, to, you know, to college, actually to run away from war. I couldn't stand it anymore. I was, you know, going insane uh, and uh, which was you know expected. <clears throat> so I went there and I was like, oh, finally, I can like live in peace. There was electricity, water <laughs> um, and few months, uh, you know, of partying and just relaxed life intoxication and, you know, all the things that you would expect from an 18, 19 year old. Um, a friend of mine came to that city a few years prior, you know, he was older than me. So he started going to college and he met devotees. He met Sai Baba followers. He met, uh, you know, transcendental meditation people. He was like into philosophy, into this you know, deep thoughts about life and everything. And people didn't like him generally because he was kind of dark, but I liked him, you know, he was my friend from Zadar. And I liked, you know, I like talking to people who are de uh, deep and in independent thinkers, you know, they actually go deeper into certain, you know, phenomenons or, or, or just expressions that we use every day like you're my friend i love you but do you really what is friend you know i was like yeah that's interesting to me as well i like to analyze things and um <clears throat> so um we i saw uh, like a poster of goranga bhajan band that was 1993 in october november something like that and so because because i was playing in the band i was playing in the band in zadar and in rieka when i went to college i immediately found a band they found me actually and so i started playing with them and uh i knew the the, the scene the musical scene you know i knew the bands and everything so i, I see this huge poster they're playing on, in the main venue in rieka and i never heard of heard of them i'm like who are these guys and so this friend of mine, he told me, oh, those are Hare Krishnas. I'm like, what's that? Oh, well, you know, it's Indian philosophy, karma, reincarnation, this and this. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, tell me more. And so uh, in, in the following month or, or two, I met uh, through him a few more people who are going there to the, you know, Hare Krishna programs. Uh, every now and then, you know, they're still smoking and drinking and, you know, regular students, <laughs> Croatian students. Um, but they develop interest in, in conversations, you know, about life and death and soul and, you know, God in, from a different perspective, you know, Eastern perspective. And I'm like, and they were uh, trying to convince me to come with them to one of those Sunday feasts. And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm not sure, <laughs> you know, long hair, cig cigarette, beer. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. It sounds too pure to me. <laughs> um, so I was kind of postponing it for a few weeks. And finally, I... <clears throat> buckled under the pressure and I went to the Hare Krishna temple it was just a house you know lower floor was uh, ground floor was uh, decorated as a temple you know I removed all the, all the furniture <laughs> tore down some walls and there was a big you know uh, like a living room made into temple room so 
I took off my shoes, I went inside, they already prepared me, there's going to be music, there's going to be a great lecture, and there's going to be wonderful food with like, you know, spiritual energy in it, and it just like hits you in the head, and you start laughing, and it's just, I'm like, all right, let's go. Um, <clears throat> and so there I was, first time uh, with Hare Krishna devotees in the temple in 1993, it was December, and... Uh, and I sat down and I looked at those pictures, you know, they were like typical Indian pictures, not not BBT pictures, but, you know, they bought from India those typical Indian, you know, very nicely, it's silk images, you know. And, you know, the pastimes of Radha and Krishna and all these things, and I'm looking around and, and seeing the altar, there was Panchatattva picture that didn't have deities, it was a Sankitan center. And I'm like, why do I feel like I'm home? What's going on with me? I should feel strange here. And although it is strange, I'm first time here and some, some weird religion. Um, and I feel like I'm home. And this was like, you know, semi scary feeling. And so as the program went on, you know, everything was just wonderful as I sort of expected, you know, because they were telling me there was a like tiny little voice, like 700 miles deep inside my heart telling me you know now that i saw devotees you know you know bold and with with tail and all these things with dressed up like that with tilak on that's something i would never want for myself at that time i wanted a new guitar a lot of drugs a lot of money you know a band to play but to become a monk no 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 that was not part of the plan but the, the, the little voice inside little but strong told me like this you will end up here i'm like what no and and my no was so weak compared to that yes you'll end up here and it was like a scary feeling you know it's like jumping out of the airplane with a parachute you, you're scared but you want to do it because there's an experience promised to you you know after after you make that initial jump that initial plunge and so I, I started coming, you know, talking to devotees more and more, you know, intimately, like after the program, I would come before the program, I would help them out, you know, clean up. Then I stayed a few times for the, you know, uh, overnight uh, I, uh, for two days, you know, like a weekend. And, I, and then I started chanting quickly, you know, 16 rounds after like three months of coming to the temple uh, on a regular basis. And I s stopped eating meat immediately. Uh, and following all other everything was you know uh, done in one day cigarettes drugs i mean drugs just smoking you know marijuana um that was luckily the only thing even though i was surrounded by you know drug addicts my hometown um together with split i don't know if you if you've heard of split dubrovnik there's dubrovnik split and then right a little bit north there's zadar and those are like three gems of Croatia. There are other smaller cities, Šibenik and so on, but people around the world usually hear about Dubrovnik, Split, and then maybe Zadar. So Split and Zadar were like, you know, <clears throat> capitals of uh, drug use. And I was very lucky. My parents, you know, my karma up, upbringing um, saved me from that, that, you know, terrible fate. But even though, you know, there are some devotees that came to the temple right after I joined, there were drug addicts when they joined. <laughs> and it was just, there was no cold turkey, there was no, n nothing going on that you would see, oh, they're coming off of heavy drug use. N no, just chanting, getting up in the morning, prasadam, lots of prasadam, lots of kirtan, service all day long, they were just healed <laughs> like that. We wouldn't even pay attention to that. We wouldn't even like, oh, are you okay? Do you have cravings? It's okay, you can cry. No, no, nothing like that. Just just devotional service. So, you know, I was lucky I, I could quit all that uh, alcohol, meat, eggs, and all these things. I still had a girl girlfriend, and uh, we were kind of coming together. I tried to see if she would like something like that. Then I would opt out, opt out of uh, Brahmacharya and choose Grihastha life with her. You know, as long as Krishna is in the center, everything else can remain the same. She didn't like it. She saw that that this was pulling me in way too strong. She could feel that. She 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 she's a woman, and she could feel that. You know that I'm. She's losing. A, 
a part of me that was obviously more important than these other parts of me, which also helped me get, you know, detached from her, even though we were um, uh, engaged <laughs> three and a half years. Yeah, I was very young. I, I'm like a one woman guy. Um, and um, and so in a few months before I actually joined the temple, I, I, I saw that, you know, she, she didn't really love me as a person, but more like the symbols that I present, you know, whatever I pr presented to her at that time. So when I removed those symbols, like a long, beautiful long hair, you know, like really long hair, you know, all the girls envied me, <laughs> like, oh my God, I want to have something like that. Uh, you know, when I cut that, I, I saw that, you know, she worshipped my hair more, more than she worshipped me, even though she claimed, you know, she loved me. But that's a not unusual story for devotees, you know, they realized that the love is not really that deep. You know, if it was, I would definitely take it. But now that you have higher standards of love and friendship and, and, and meaning of life, it, you can't be bought by superficial attention from people who are not interested in, in anything deeper in life than sense gratification, you know, and just enjoying material life. That's fine, but, you know, if there's nothing deeper than that, then it's not fine. <laughs> it's not fine on its own, yeah. So, you know, that, um, I broke it off and uh, I joined the temple. Actually, I came from the college, it was 94, um, May, uh, June, I came home. My parents didn't know anything. They just knew that I quit cigarettes and that I cut off my hair. So they were like, oh, <laughs> that's good. And then I came home, I told them I quit eating meat. Oh, okay, I guess that's healthy. You know, a little weird because we are very much meat eating and fish. My father was a fisherman. <laughs> so it's like, oh God. Um, uh, you know, that's strange. Like, are you going to get enough of, you know, nutrition and, oh, don't worry about it. But then when they realized that it was because of religion and not our religion, but some other religion that nobody ever heard of in Croatia at that time. Plus it was war, middle of the war, 94, that's like middle of the war in Croatia. It's like huge uh, military actions were prepared and executed at that time. My father was, of course, you know, in the regular service. I was also in the regular service for three months as a teenager. <laughs> so I got uh, triple points for that in the military. Um, and I had a gun and everything. Uh, uh, so he was like, what the hell are you doing? Betraying everything. He was really angry. My mom was in shock. She was on pills. She ended up in the emergency room because of stress, because they didn't know where I was going. And I wasn't going in Croatia. I actually got through the devotees in Rijeka. I got connections with Sweden. Uh, and uh, one devotee who was managing the farm in, I think, Amvikskart or Korsnskart, uh, I approached him and I said, look, I want to join the temple, but I want to go somewhere where there's a lot of devotees, a lot of service, so I can be trained re really well. I know my mind. I don't want to be amongst familiar things. I want to go somewhere where nobody knows me and I know nobody. So there's no, you know, so so I really have to serve and, and transform myself. I really wanted to become a good devotee. And he says, okay, yeah, there's still some room, you know. Do you mind working on land and with cows? I said, anything you give me, I'll, I'll do anything. <laughs> I said, okay, we like that. And so they actually arranged the ticket and everything was waiting for me. So I came home June and I told my parents what I was going to do. And they almost killed me. They took away my passport, said, you're not going anywhere. Even though I had the right, I could just, you know, <laughs> fight my way take the passport and I alienate my parents forever, you know, from Hare Krishna movement, but I didn't want to do that. So I asked the voters, what should I do? They, they, they took my passport away. So it's just wait, it's Krishna's arrangement. Don't fight them. And it's uh, their parents, you know, they're not some, some people, you know, so you should see what Krishna wants. And so that whole summer I had to stay home. But I lived as I live as I was planning on living, you know, getting up early in the morning, chanting my rounds, offering food, reading books, you know, preaching to my friends, going for swimming, you know, just chanting all day long, <laughs> listening Walkman lectures. So like I was in the temple. After three months, my mom came. My father wouldn't even look at me. I was lucky that he didn't beat me up, you know, and he's this huge guy, fisherman, and I'm like this skinny. Um, and so she gave me three hundred dollars and a, a muchi box. You know, she bought me all these things for shaving and all that. She says, "Okay, you know, in my passport." And she says, "Go and come back." 
And so I went to Pregrada. Now, actually, I went to Zagreb then. I was hitchhiking to Zagreb to pick up the tickets because they were waiting for me there, airplane ticket. And I came there and I called Navadip uh, Prabhu. He was a temple president at that time in, of one of the big temples in Croatia. A big preacher at that time, the biggest preacher almost in the whole Europe, one of the top preachers, and Grihasta. He was called White, White Sanyasi or White Swami, something like that. You know, He was a really great preacher and he was my personal mentor. So I called him and say, uh, you know, there was supposed to be tickets for me. Uh, he says, oh, but where were you? You were supposed to come three months ago. I said, yeah, my parents, and this and that. He says, yeah, you know what? They told me that they, meanwhile, 50 Russian devotees came to live in Sweden, in, in Swedish farm, and uh, there's no more room for you. So, sorry, you're going to have to join some other temple. So, I'm like, so I'm talking to him on the phone with Navadip, and I said, well, what about your temple? <laughs> he says, you know, sure, if you want to come. So, I... I stayed in Croatia in, in Temple Pregrada Temple. That was the first temple that we own. We owned the house. I'm kind of sorry that we sold it later. We sold it a year after I came and we went back to Rijeka. Um, so, yeah, that was my journey to, to devotees. Uh, in so many details, of course, you can, every devotee can write a book about all the details, how, you know, the Krishna, Krishna's arrangements, you know, that's, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming devotees understand that. It was not just, you know, I bought the ticket and I went to the temple. There was war, you know, war and torn country. It was difficult to travel, especially to hitchhike. So it was, uh, it was amazing, actually, life that Krishna produced for me, you know, in front of me and offered uh, for me to take it. And I took it. And I ended up in Temple of Pregrada, where there was a lot of Sankirtan devotees. Basically everyone at the time wanted to be a Sankirtan devotee. So I joined that crew for three months. I cleaned the temple, of course, as it, as I should have. And I was supposed to do that for six months and then maybe Sankirtan. But I, I was really like, can I, can I, I want, I want to. Because I saw all the devotees, you know, coming from these Sankirtan centers to the main temple of Pregrada. And, you know, for a weekend, and then Roaring Kirtans, amazing festivals, you know, and then they leave. They leave somewhere. They can't wait to leave. I'm like, wh why am I here? Why am I at the temple? I should be with them on the front line. So I developed, like, this strong urge to go with them outside and to just, you know, risk my life and to burn it out for Krishna. I, I had that strong desire. I still have it. <laughs> Um, so I went to that preaching center. It was uh, 94 December. It was still 94 uh, December. Prabhupada Marathon, and I started distributing books and 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 incense and and prasadam, whatever they you know had. I took it with me in a bag and I went out and I. So I did that for a year and a half. I wasn't that, you know especially good in that. I was also distributing CDs and tapes at that time. That was. Harikesh Swami uh, thought that that would be a great idea to distribute uh, our own, you know, tapes. So we actually made some uh, copies of Aindra's, you know, Brindavan Mellows, and we printed it nicely, and we actually sold that. I loved selling to people who never heard Hare Krishna tune, <laughs> let alone a Brindavan Kirtan, and they loved it. It was like from another planet, you know. I would put Walkman on their heads, you know, people, when I stopped them. And I listened to this, you know, and they would go like, what is that? You know, the roaring kirtan, Indra, you know. Um, and so so I had some success doing that. But I actually, because I was a musically inc inclined, Navadi Prabhu recognized that. And he always wanted to have like a band, sort of not just bhajan band, but also modern band. So we can do Sunday feast, nice little, you know, rock or ambient or jazzy type of, you know. Uh, higher class. So there was one other devotee at that time that was part of congregational congregation and he was a, a, a musical genius. He was a professor on the musical academy. And so he played multiple instruments like a virtuoso. So, so having something like so, someone like that in the congregation and also very humble and very willing to to serve anything, you know, and not married, no children. So it was wonderful. So him and I, we started, you know, organizing this band. We called it uh, Supreme. And we uh, we recorded one album, sort of like pop jazz song, songs. And um, uh, 
at that time, you know, I recognized that what we do on Sunday feasts, you know, we, we would usually use tampuras, microphones, sometimes bass guitar, and it would sound lovely, you know, people loved it. And I thought, why not taking this um, atmosphere of Sunday feast bhajan, you know, all plugged in, speakers, tampura, some other instruments, and take it out on the street. And this is where my sort of career, uh, devotional career began. The Krishna inspired me that, you know, these Harinams don't sound very good to me. Ting, 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 bungi, bungi, bungi. And people go like, you know, some of them go like, oh, this is crazy, I love it. And then we go, oh, it's working. But most people go like, ah, oh. because they listen to, you know, highly, produced music all the time and what we give them <laughs> is not even recordable <laughs> you know from the air and uh, and I thought why not bringing them you know really nice polished music let's see how they're gonna react Let, let's see you know what Krishna wants so um, in the beginning at, at, the authorities of course they said yes please do it so the first Harinam was amazing. We took the carpet, you know, like a flying carpet. <laughs> we put it in the, on the main square. We took the, the rolling cable. We asked the first bar if we can borrow some electricity for our speaker. He said, we will give you some money. If he says, oh, you're going to play? Yeah, no problem. Just take the electricity. You know. So we would plug it, drag, you know, 30 <laughs> yards, and then... Um, plug in all the amplifiers, speakers, and we had the carpet and, you know, uh, for, for devotees to sit. And we plugged in the microphones. And as soon as we started setting up and big Maha Mantra behind us, as soon as we started set, setting up like the serious gear like that, like that, people started gathering. We didn't even start chanting. It was like a hundred people around us before wow. we even started chanting. And we were like, oh my God, this is working. Now we have to really perform. So I realized that... Um, if we do good Harinam, you know, like really prepare it and, and sing it, chant it, chant it, but also sing it and in multiple voices, you know, harmonies like that, you can get hundreds of people glued to you, absolutely unable to leave. And this was every single Harinam after that. And I did thousands and thousands of Harinams like that. So, you know, my temple president, he says, you know what, you should take uh, our van, the smallest van that we have, take one or two devotees from the temple and the rest of them from the congregation, you know, and just go on tour. And I'm like, really? And I just got initiated. So he was like young devotee, you know, two years in the temple. That's not, not even two years, year and a half in the temple. I got initiated in 96. And right after in initiation, he says, take the van, take the equipment and go. You know, report your uh, Harinam to the police, you know, a day or two before, like it's law, and just do it. And that was such a success. I could, it, it, it's like still like from the dream. I, I still remember that like a, like amazing, long running dream. It was such a success. We had hundreds of people around us every single night. And every night we, we did Harinam in, in a different, you know, small town. We went to the islands, coastline, of course. It was summer and we absolutely, you know, rocked it. We came back after a month. We had so much Lakshmi. We, had, we collected so much money. <laughs> people loved it. We collected so many addresses. People wanted us to call them. They wanted to join us. They wanted everything we had on the, on the stand. You know, we had a little like a stand with books and like a table, you know, with books and, and, and these uh, necklaces. And they wanted to buy everything. So it was like a green light from Krishna. It says, do this. I want you to do this and do it really well. So for the next three years, we bought bigger van, we bought all the equipment, you know, for, for us, so we, we don't depend on any temple. Nobody can call us at any time when we're on tour. Hey, come back, it's Janmashtami, we need you, we need the equip equipment. No, no, we're independent, you get your own stuff. And Rohini Sutta Prabhu, because I had some disagreements with, um, at that time, the temple president, because he was paying attention more to what's going on, you know, Sunday feast and all that. Uh, then to our Harinam tour, which was extremely successful at that time. So that was 96, 97, and 98. In 99, we went to America. We left Croatia. And so those three years, we, we did the whole summer, like from the May until the end of October, we would go from the top of Croatian coastline all the way down to Dubrovnik. 
and we would do Harinam after Harinam after Harinam each evening. And um, and I, there are some recordings on YouTube. If you type in JHP, which stands for Jagannath Harinam Party, that's that was our name, Jagannath Harinam Party. We actually we actually made an album. It's also on my channel, uh, you know, Bajans, and. Um, uh, we had a van. We printed a big juggernaut on, on on the van, and we had uh, you know like seven devotees, a lot of equipment, and we had a separate car with matajis, who would come with us. You know, th those were like local matajis, mostly students who were free on summer, and they were like, "Can we go with us? Can we go with you?" And uh, I said, "Well, it's a lot of austerities because we sleep outside. We didn't have." Um, accommodations with devotees. There was just a few grihastas, and they just couldn't accept ten devotees, you know, at once. So sometimes we accommodated matajis, you know, to sleep somewhere, you know, if somebody offered. But most of the time, it was just open air somewhere in the forest, illegally, of course. But it was wartime, so you know, we could do a lot of things that we couldn't do. Uh, actually, in 96, there was no war in Croatia, but still Bosnia and then later on Serbia. So it was war around us, but not in Croatia anymore. So we could travel. There were tourists, especially Germans, Italians. Oh, they couldn't wait for war to end so that they can swarm on the Croatian coast. And there we were, you know, just, just we came inside like in a bee's nest, you know, so many tourists. And they had no, nothing to do. It was just us, you know, like um, ice cream parlors, some cafes, some restaurants, just the usual thing. Um, they didn't have any street performance, and we were the only ones with the equipment. And actually, since the electricity was a problem, not everybody will give you electricity. And because Harinam depends on that, we had to have our own. So I bought this little <clears throat> uh, generator. <laughs> because in the war, in some cities, especially in my city, there was no electricity. And all these cafes, you know, with, with those slot machines and stuff like that, uh, they needed electricity. So they, they all bought these uh, portable, sort of like noiseless, mean, means less noise. And then when the war ended, they had plenty of them. I could buy it for, like, <laughs> for nothing. So we bought a nice little Honda, 650 watt. We could plug in uh, the, the lights, you know, like spotlights for the night because we always played at night. It was summer. You can only play at night. You know, people are otherwise on the beaches. So we would turn on like lights and big maha mantra behind us, carpet, devotees, headset, microphones, bass guitar, harmonium, and people would just gather in hundreds and hundreds. And they bought, bought books and necklaces. They wanted Tilak to be put on. We had in Dubrovnik one, once we had 20 Italians walking around with triple necklaces with Tilak on, with beers and cigarettes. It was like a controversial at that time. <laughs> like, should we do it or not? They wanted Tilak on. They wanted to look like us. They wanted to be with us. They were so attracted to devotees. And we're like, you know, we should do it. We should definitely do it. So it was it's so many amazing, um, you know, episodes with Krishna in Harinam like that. How to cook in such conditions. We have always had to cook in the van. We had to hide somewhere because it was all illegal. If police caught us, you know, cooking somewhere, uh, you know, illegally and going to the camps, it was way too expensive. It was way too many of us. That, that's the, the, the whole crew of 10 people traveling together. So Matajis would sleep like 20, 30 yards away from us in the tents. And uh, we would cook together, eat together, have morning program together, and then kind of rest, go to Sankirtan, collecting some boga during the daytime, and then nighttime, Harinam from 8 to almost midnight. And then from <laughs> after that, we would look for a place to sleep, because you can sleep just anywhere. One person, yes. Two people, yeah. But 10 people. So sometimes we would go to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning. We couldn't find a place to sleep, you know. And then at 7 o'clock in the morning, police would usually wake us up. And get up, you can't sleep here. And then we would say, we're just humble monks. We are leaving right away. Oh, you're monks, okay. <laughs> it was just wonderful, wonderful life, but very austere. But I got used to it. I thought it was normal. Like, if you want to do this, you have to live like this. <laughs> So then um, a lot of devotees invited us to come to America. They said, Kakudmi, you have to come to America. America is huge. You would be like a king here. Everything would be your kingdom. You know, you could play Harinams everywhere. And uh, it was a fact that not a lot of Harinam, barely any Harinam crew had the equipment like we like we did. And, and um, 
and the repertoire of, of songs that are so easy to dance to and to go crazy, you know, like Indra Dumna Swami and Sri Prahlad. Uh, in the 90s, there was also Transcendental Village with, um, what's his name? I forgot. I, I used to know his name. Something with R, a Polish devotee or Czech devotee, something like that. They had this band, Transcendental Village, and they had these amazing songs that are so easy to uh, dance to. So I learned them and kind of developed my own style, and it was a winner. Uh, devotees loved it everywhere we came, anywhere we came. Um, we also went to one um, tour of Germany, France, Sweden, and uh, we played at the temples there as well. <laughs> Devotees were just exploding with ecstasy because we were so well trained, you know, with always similar songs. We had huge repertoire, but we will, you know, day after day, same songs. We became like a pro, you know, um, and um, and then finally, because Hari Kesh left, the temples, you know, dipped into a huge crisis. A lot of devotees left and uh, we still had that invitation from America. <laughs> And the temple presidents at that time, leaders at that time, were not very inspiring for us because we were at this high level of vibration, Harinam, all the time. Every And in the wintertime, we weren't idle. We were doing public programs at the, some public, you know, space, like, um, like cinemas, old cinemas or schools. We would make the same thing, but indoors. And then we could also give longer lecture, make great prasadam and then invite a lot of people to come to the temple. It was very successful. I mean, we were bringing tons of devotees uh, to ISKCON temples at that time. And uh, so, yeah, winter, summer, all year rounds from 96 to 99. And then in February 99, we went to India. Um, Mahatattva Prabhu and, uh, and myself, he was part of my crew for the last two years. Um, and basically we after that we basically traveled the whole world to, together and now he's known as Bhakti Ananda Tirta Swami. Bhakti Ananda Tirta Swami is the first Croatian sannyasi uh, in ISKCON. Yeah, and the youngest sannyasi I think so far. He's a year younger than me. <clears throat> um, and um, so we went to India to sort of prepared for our trip to America. We still didn't have any visas, but we were planning on getting, you know, some invitations to go there. Uh, and we went to India to buy a lot of paraphernalia so we can live off of that in America. You know, doing Harinams, you have to sell, a lot of, you know, different things like especially necklaces and some other, you know, things that people like, japas as well, incense, of course, uh, tilaks. We would sell those and that's how we would maintain, you know, and cover our costs of traveling all the time. Um, and so we went to India and there we, we met Pritu Prabhu, which I, of course, knew from before. And he was very fond of me, uh, even today. He was, for some reason, always very fond of me because, I guess, musician, preacher, Harinam. Uh, it's easy to be likable, I guess, <laughs> on those terms. So he um, offered me to come to America, like, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of your visas, you just bring all the devotees. I had to pay for the tickets, of course. And that. Meanwhile, I got married f uh, with one Mataji who was traveling with us for the longest time. I tried to <laughs> like chase her away, go, go, I don't want to get married. She was so persistent that I finally, you know, gave in. And, uh, you know, it's a trick, you just have to be persistent and subservient and yes sir and finally a man will take you as his wife a dumb man like i am and so <clears throat> we got married but the condition was look we're going to america and this is what we're doing if you want to be my wife you can just continue with your service she was a good singer and good sankirtan devotee and uh, you know a very presentable lady and so it was like an, an addition to our um uh, full-time crew yeah, sure, as long as she's your wife, you know, she's not just a Mataji there, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate. But the full-time Mataji, yeah, only uh, like this. So, of course, that wasn't the only reason um, why I got married to her. So, um, we got married, I went to India, we came back from India, and in June of 99, we went to America, and the three of us. Maharaj, at that time he was Mahatattva uh, Prabhu, uh, my uh, then wife, my first wife, and myself. There were su supposed to be other devotees coming with with us because our crew was bigger. 
One of them got stuck in Croatia because of military. Military service pulled him in. The other one went to America before us because he wanted to meet with his guru, um, Bhakti Tirta Swami. So he says, please, can I go earlier so I can like meet him there, maybe got initiated and all that. And when you guys come, I'll just join you and we'll go our own, you know, our own merry ways of Harinam preaching throughout America. So by the time we got to America, he got pretty engaged with Bhakti Tirta Maharaj. He actually got some pretty high services and he told me, please forgive me, I cannot join you. So at the end, it was just three of us, not enough. Uh, for a good Harinam crew. And so we came to America. The first thing that we did, we went to the Rainbow Festival at that time. It was 99 in Pennsylvania in, in uh, uh, Allegheny Forest National Park. It was so beautiful. My first experience of America is Allegheny Forest Rainbow Gathering Festival with naked people and all kinds of people and all kinds of spiritual camps. It was the first experience like that. I loved it. I completely lost my voice. I couldn't speak after that for like uh, 10 days because there's no microphones. There's nothing, you know, there's no meat, actually. No meat, no fish, no alcohol, no amplification, no electricity, but a lot of drugs. <laughs> a lot of drugs and naked people like that's okay. And so we had a huge camp with Pritu Prabhu there and some of his devotees came, uh, his disciples and um, uh, Maharaj and I, I mean Mahatattva and I, we joined him. My wife was supposed to come a few weeks later after we are done with the festival. She was supposed to come and then we go to Oregon. We were supposed to go to Pritu Prabhu's temple and do Harinams there in Portland. So first two weeks in, uh, in Allegheny Forest, it was just... There it would be it's supposed to be like a three series of three hours of, of your podcast to cover everything I saw there. But the preaching was just amazing. And we took three or four devotees with us in the van back to the Portland Temple after the festival, new devotees. And so when that was done, we went to Portland. My wife came. We went to Portland and we started doing Harinams there. We had all the support from Pritu Prabhu. It was his temple and there was a temple president there who was a Serbian devotee and there was another Bosnian devotee there. So we were like, ah, our people, you know, it was just wonderful. But Portland is just rain and rain and rain and rain, you know, Seattle, Portland, Seattle, even worse. So we were like, we can't do Harinams here in the middle of summer. It was 99 summer and it was just raining every other day. And he says, yeah, you know what? You're not going <laughs> to profit very much here. You should go to L.A. Let me recommend you to Slovas Prabhu in L.A. And let's see if he's willing to. It's a big community. Everybody wants to go there. So don't have high expectations. You know, you're not the only one. So let's see what he says. So I talked to him. He says, OK, we don't have a Harinam crew. So Vasprabhu said over the phone, um, why don't you come for Ratha Yatra festival? It was already August at that time and spend two weeks here. And then we'll see how we match up. Let's see what we can do. And finally, we came to L.A. It was a beautiful trip. And I saw the Santa Monica Promenade. One devotee uh, showed me, like, this is where you're going to do Harinams. And it was like a dream, like a paradise. That's it. I'm staying here. I'm never going away. I'm going to die in this city. Uh, Los Angeles, for me, was like a climate and just that Santa Monica Promenade. And people, actually, you can have permit to do Harinams there. You, there. There are permits and there are regulations. Everything is regulated. I'm like, wonderful. So... Basically, Svavas Prabhu liked us. He says, yeah, we could use Harinam a crew like that, even if it's just three of us. Uh, we can take some devotees from the temple. In the next year, I actually had another devotee from my crew flown to America. I, I, ha I had Svavas Prabhu take care of his, you know, immigration and everything. I said, I need one more devotee from Croatia who knows how to sing my tunes and who is willing to go on Harinams all the time. So we got another uh, crew member. So it was four of us. Of course, my wife got pregnant, so it was, again, three of us. <laughs> but we had some devotees from L.A. Temple. <clears throat> it wasn't easy, as you would think, like L.A. Temple, so many devotees. Yeah, but everybody's engaged. Either Sankirtan or, or, or kitchen for the restaurant or shop or so many other services, you know. <clears throat> Big temple, a lot of expenses. And it was hard for, for us to get a, someone to go with us every day, uh, you know, in the evening. But we managed, you know, got, uh, we got uh, new equipment. 
uh, instead of the generator, we got a battery, marine, huge truck battery and the inverter. That, that was the like, big deal at that time, uh, just starting. So we had quiet Harinams uh, on Santa Monica Promenade. I mean, quiet, uh, no noise. Uh, we got along with street performers at that time pretty well. They loved us. Um, but it was a different success. You see, Los Angeles, there's so many street performers. People are saturated with sense gratification and all these offers. We were nothing new to them. But on Saturdays, when more devotees would come, when we, we, we would have a setup similar to Jagannath Harinam party in Croatia, like seven, eight devotees and all singing in microphones, then we would gather a huge crowd. Then you could distribute a lot of books. You could invite somebody to come to the temple because they were impressed by what they see and hear, especially what they hear. You know, a lot of the world is uh, uh, dancing. They saw that. Dancing Hare Krishnas, they saw that. But they never heard almost studio performance, you know, uh, uh, bhajans. So uh, that was quite interesting. We managed to recruit, recruit some devotees in, in, in Los Angeles over those years, but nothing like in Croatia. It was a difficult job to get Americans to join the temple, but we managed to get some. So uh, we were doing that. Uh, my son was born there. And uh, in those years, we were doing a lot of Martin Luther King's parade, um, uh, Halloween Harinam in Santa Monica. I have those videos on my Kakudmi channel. You can just type in JHP uh, Halloween and then you'll get three or four videos or even more from Los Angeles. So you can see how we had those huge Harinams there. But over the week, we would go like two or three times a week to Santa Monica Promenade. It was like a nice, <clears throat> quiet Harinam for devotees. People would like it, you know, they would like it. We just didn't get huge crowds. So I took that as a new phase of my service. Krishna wants me to do service unattached to the results. This is how it is here. And just go out and do your service. So I was doing that until they revoked our permit. Um, on on some crazy basis, like we, we had to list every devotee that comes to Harinam. So when they come and see our permit, that all those people are there. If they're not, they can fine us. And I was a poor Grihasta, I couldn't afford those fines. So I told the temple, look, they're doing this now, and that's completely unconstitutional. We're doing religious ritual here. We have the right to do that. And every time some other devotee wants to come with us to Harinam. I remember so many gurus, you know, Maharajas would come to LA. They, they found out that we have regular Harinam crew. They can come with us. Um, I remember Bhakti Siddhanta uh, Maharaj, once he came, he was so jet lagged. He says, Kakudmi, I heard you have Harinam crew here. Can I go with you, please? I need to get out of this tamas. And he was so grateful. And now I couldn't do it anymore. So Amarendra Prabhu, the, the lawyer, <clears throat> at that time they had that big, big court case, you know, 400 million. I, in the middle of it, uh, I asked him, can you please fix this? And he says, yeah, I can fix that. Uh, that's unconstitutional. I take care of that. We're religion. They're going to allow us to do regular permits, you know, so we can play. But it never happened. And this is where my Harinam service stopped, sort of. Also, my marriage went down the train. That was 2006. Um, we split up, but I stayed really close to community, basically walking distance, five minutes. So I, I was still there living with another devotee, you know, like a roommate. Doing my computer job, I was doing computer jobs there, you know, like a computer guy to maintain my family. And since my Harinam service, you know, dropped, um, I was doing just one or two Harinams a year, you know, Halloween or Martin Luther King or something like that, Ratha Yatra. And I thought, well, okay, I'm a Grihasta now. I can't really travel. I have this marriage that doesn't work and I have to basically maintain my family. I know how this works. Many devotees were and are still in my position. So there's nothing new. You just have to, you know, uh, sort of uh, adapt to, to these new changes and maybe preach online. So I was doing some forum preaching, you know, irritating scientists, you know, telling them how stupid they are. A little bit of fun, a little bit of preaching, but that, that was not it, you know, comparing to my previous service, this, this is nothing. I was always dreaming of traveling, but how? But, um, and so this is where the 2007 came and I got healed. I healed myself from something we didn't talk about <laughs> so far. This this was just my journey through 
you know, uh, ISKCON movement and going to America, India, America, and doing Harinams there. And then uh, this is when 2007, 2008, I came back to Croatia, but for a different reason now. And the reason was because in 1999, uh, 1998, so a year before I went to America, I started getting back pain, you know, issues. And that was nothing unusual. Like two or three devotees in my in our crew, in our group, uh, uh, were also having, you know, some pains and cracking backs and, you know, helping each other. You know, when you stand like this and somebody comes from behind and then lifts you up and your your spine just goes crack and you go like, oh, that feels good, you know. Or if you go like this, ah, oh, and then like that. Ah. So we were doing these things because we spend a lot of time in the van, a lot of time, you know, pumping harmonium on the floor. So I thought maybe, you know, dragging heavy equipment, you know, musical equipment, all these microphones and stands and speakers, you have to drag them from the van to the main market square. You can't just drive a lot of times into the market square where you play you have to drag all that equipment so i thought maybe that but that was not heavy i'm a young guy i can take that it's not a big deal why my back hurts so it was in the beginning dull pain you know just dull pain in the lower back i crack it a little bit and it's better but over time it became you know persistent it didn't spread anywhere it was just more persistent i couldn't get rid of it so I thought maybe I kind of made it worse because of all this cracking and bending and all, all this trying to relieve, relieve, the, pain, relieve the pain. Um, maybe I damaged something, so I started worrying about it. Um, and then I went to India. That, that, what I mentioned, that's, that was the only time I went to India in uh, February of 99. And in the airplane uh, on the way there, so it was first London and then... Calcutta, uh, Delhi and then Calcutta because we went to Jagannath Puri and then Mayapur and then Vrindavan. So there was problems on the way there. You know, there was some delay on the uh, Heathrow airport and then we came to, uh, on the way there, on the way to India, on the flight there, it was a long flight, as you know, I don't know, 20 hours or something like that. My back was killing me. I had a feeling that I had a, like a <clears throat> fireball inside my you know in the lower back and just couldn't get comfortable it was really painful oh my god couldn't wait to get there finally we got there and then there was of course in Calcutta delays on the train station hours and hours of waiting you have no idea why finally train came another 16 hour delays on the way to Jagannath Puri by the time I got there I was sick I, my body was just holding it in and we when we came to the hotel of Jagannath uh, Puri, um, one of the hotels there on the beach, I just collapsed. And for the next five days, I couldn't drink, I couldn't eat. I was just in the bathroom and laying down, you know, couldn't even walk after that. Finally, I got better and saw one day of Jagannath Puri and then went to Calcutta, I mean, um, Mayapur, Vrindavan, all with the back pain. And the only I spent maybe last two weeks in Vrindavan with no back pain. For some reason, you know, mercy of the Holy Dham. I didn't have back pain. But as soon as I came back to Croatia, my pain continued. So basically, it was uh, safe for the, you know, two weeks in India. It was just pain, pain, pain. Um, and then we, came, we went to America in 99. The pain continued there. Many devotees recommended different things. I had good friendship with Kroda Shyamani Mataji, Prabhupada disciple there. She was at that time big. I don't know if she still is. She's, you know, older than me. So she should be over 60, maybe 70 now. She was big in Iyengar yoga. And she told me, you have to do these pulls and those pulls. And and then I, I, I made friends with one chiropractor also older than me, you know, professional guy. I made a devotee out of him. <laughs> he became a devotee because of me. And so, you know, I asked him, can you please help me with this back? I mean, you're a chiropractor. Don't, don't give me any story. Just tell me as it is. Do I need surgery? Do I need, what do I need to do? And why am I suffering? And so he treated me a few times and he says, you know, you need to take care of this. You need to go to x-ray and then we'll see. So I never did that. I ne never went to a doctor. So I didn't know what was happening. And all these years, you know, he gave me some exercises. I did them, didn't help. 
I didn't. I never took any pills. I hated those things. Um, uh, and so I was just suffering. And by the time we came to America, the pain was constant. So for the next eight years, so eight and a half, so almost nine years, the pain was constant, and it was spreading to the upper, you know, back, all the way up to shoulders and neck. I was in pain every day, all throughout my back. And then it was also going to my hips and joints. I felt like I was rotten, like cancer was in every cell, in every muscle, in every bone. That's how I felt. If somebody offered to give me a bionicle torso at that time, I would accept it. Give me a robot torso, I'll accept it. I'll rather deal with screws and, and chips than with this rotten, painful flesh, you know. That's how I felt. And then at one point, what happened is that I got almost paralyzed. It was some trigger moment for me. Um, at that time, I was already divorced. So I thought maybe, you know, relationship with my wife, because it was strained and she wasn't happy. And, uh, after divorce, if the pain lets, lets off, then it's probably that. But it didn't. So it wasn't that. Um, <clears throat> so a year and a half after the divorce, I got, you know, I had a other relationship with another woman. Uh, and I wanted to get married to her, but finally she decided she wouldn't. And that was the trigger when my back got really bad. And for the next 10 days, I was just lying on the floor, unable to get up. I was able to stand on my feet just enough to, uh, even bathroom, I had to sit down all the time. I was able to stand for two minutes. I thought, my God, I let the cancer spread all over my spinal cord and now I'm going to die and leave my seven-year-old, you know, with his mom and in America. <laughs> and it's horrible. What did I do? Why didn't, why didn't I go to the doctor? So, uh, and it was a plan to go. I even had, had an appointment to go to do x-ray and maybe, you know, afterwards surgery and all that, but I couldn't move for 10 days. So finally, a, a devoted friend of mine whom, with whom I, um, I did uh, computer work with him, some jobs, and uh, we were really good friends, and he knew about my situation. He, he called me one night and said, look, I have this book from this guy. His name is Dr. John Sarno. John E. Sarno, S-A-R-N-O. And... <clears throat> He he's saying here, he told me, he's saying here that it's all emotional, that it has nothing to do with physical things. No diseases, nothing, just emotional. And you have your divorce and problems, you know, the financial. I was also illegal in America. I, I, we came legally on R, R1 visa, but then one devotee gave me wrong inst instructions on how to renew my, um, after a year, uh, how to renew my visa. And I, and I, I was left there, you know, without um, papers. So I was illegally there. I was working illegally. <laughs> Hi, America. Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't leave. I had a child, but my my child was legal and my wife was okay. I mean, she she had another devotee take care of her papers. She was okay. So temple kind of felt bad because you know devotee that worked for the temple screwed up my paper papers. So they like you know, all right, we'll take care of you. You can live here in the community. Just do some service and. So that was kind of lucky and unlucky because if I had a work permit, I would still be in America. I had some great job offers at that time because of my computer knowledge. And I couldn't accept it because I couldn't work, you know, legally. <clears throat> so finally, yeah, he told me this Dr. John Sarno is saying, you know, it's all mental. And I'm like, all right, that sounds like Vedic because in the Vedas, we know that everything comes from the mind. The mind is the source of all troubles. But how? Where? What am I doing in my mind that is causing me this kind of debilitating pain? This is incredible. It's like somebody's pushing knife into my bones. <laughs> you know, nobody can tell me why. Um, and so, uh, you know, I went online. I got up for two minutes. I typed in Dr. John Sarno and I got a transcript. It was so 2007, December. 
um, transcript of some radio show that he uh, presented his findings. You know, he's an old doctor, just general practitioner that figured out in the 70s that this back pain issues, this epidemic at that time, it was nonsense. Like people are getting back pain for no reasons and that, that persistent back pains. He realized it was coming from the mind, from... And what he realized, so I read these few sentences that triggered all the my Vedic knowledge that I had so far as a preacher. You have to you have to know a lot. You have to know how to deal with people, different people. And if you're successful at that, that means you know some psychology, uh, uh, at least useful in the Vedic terms, you know. <clears throat> so I said, okay, that sounds like Vedic. Let me, you know read what the guy says because i was very skeptical of psychology and, and medical practice in general i i consider them all cheaters you know mostly uh, there are a lot of sincere people there but you know the, the science is mostly you know not very good comparing to the vedic uh, it's very superficial and starts from one point and ends in one point there's a lot of context that they skip over so they're uh, how do you say diagnosis are not acceptable to me <clears throat> and so he said he said like this whatever emotional whatever situation you have in your life that you don't like that you are attempting to change and it's not working you know and you hate it or hate it you don't notice that you hate it you just go against it you go against whatever is in your life be that people situation finances health anything whatever you resist persists that's how he said i'm like oh my god i have a list of few things in my, mostly my life was great i had great relationship with devotees there um i loved what i what i was doing you know computers and all that it was easy job for me um i had satisfying relationship at the time with with my girlfriend and I had very good relationship with my son, you know, and I was there. I was there in his life all the time. And the only, I was happy with myself as, as, as well, you know. I, I couldn't object to anything more than regular objections of, you know, I'm in Maya, I'm in this world, I'm going to die one day, and I'm not yet surrendered to Krishna. Yeah, you know, just nothing out of the ordinary with me. But how long that pain lasted for nine years and it was just getting worse and worse and worse. That was out of the ordinary. That was like, what the hell? You know, uh, you, I couldn't think anymore. You know, it was just there all the time. I remember one day, maybe like a week before I, I, I self-healed, I said, Krishna, will I ever feel my body without the pain because it was 24 hours 24 7 it wasn't like you know a certain time of day i woke up four or five times a night to change my position so i can continue sleeping <laughs> it was just horrible and you can notice it on my face only when i would do this then people would go you you have a back problem otherwise i would hide it i would just you know this joyful you know happy positive person that i always was you know um and so I read that and I believed him. I believed John Sarno. I said, yes, you are right. I am resisting a lot of things in my life. I want things to happen differently. I want to have regular job. I want to have green card. I want to have more money. I want to have a good wife. <laughs> I want to have this and that, you know, and I'm not getting it. You know, it's not happening. And I cannot, you know, ask Krishna all the time, begging, come on, give me this, give me that. I know I'm a devotee. I know I'm going to get whatever I deserve. I cannot ask. And even this disease, it could be my karma. It could be some sinful activities that I did and offenses. I cannot complain. What am I supposed to do? If Krishna wants me to get healthy, I'll get healthy. But it didn't work. This line of thought didn't really work. Why? Because I didn't understand why I'm suffering. Once you understand why you're suffering, the suffering stops. You don't have to do anything. No position, asana, or change of diet, or a change of pillows and mattresses, nothing, nothing, <laughs> has nothing to do with that. And my problem was so severe because of a lot of driving I did in LA and a lot of sitting in, uh, next to computer. I actually had to sit like a woman giving birth. My legs had to go up like this on the table and I had special chairs that were, you know, recline like this and special pillows under, underneath my lower back also when i was driving special pillows otherwise five minutes and i was 
kaput. I couldn't, I couldn't, I had to get out. I had to get up every day for nine years. Can you imagine that? <laughs> you know, I, I became like a, like a, a disabled person. I just had to learn to live with my disabilities. It was terrible. Um, but I couldn't complain. I didn't complain, you know, to people. Uh, I didn't play like a victim. I just, you know, it's my life. What can I do? So finally, I, uh, it took me five minutes to set up in my head like a, like a vow. From now on, everything that's happening in my life is perfect for me. It's like a nectar. Even if they're if they're putting nails in my in my in my hands, I'll go like thank you, Krishna, because this dog needs this leash. I am like a dog, you know. My senses, my my embodiment, my my whole perception is like a dog. You know, I'm a low class embodied living soul that you know cannot really handle this life without huge amount of help. I'm so dependent. And I'm struggling here, here on the other side of the world, trying to maintain my life, and it's not really working. And maybe I should give it up, give up this desire for control and betterment, which means control. You know, if I want better, that means I want how I want. And it was, Krishna just wasn't rewarding me. But I did so many Harinams. I couldn't even say that. I couldn't even think that because I knew if I say that, I'm trading all of my devotional service for what? For a few months of rent in, in, in expensive Los Angeles? No, 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 no. So I was basically, you know, kind of trapped inside myself. I couldn't really ask for anything. And I wanted things. Deep inside, I was frustrated that I'm in pain. That I don't know why. And so finally what I did, I realized how much control I want. And how much I was kind of, you know, kind of afraid for my future. You know, being the kind of character that I am, I'm very analytical, I'm very forward thinking. And if I'm not sure what I'm going to do in, in two months or next month, you know, if I'm going to have enough job or anything else, I, I don't like it. I feel it in my heart like a cancer. You know, this is not a good situation for me, you know, and, and, and but I'm a devotee. Why, why do I have to have so much control? You know, so it's yeah, conflicting. So finally, I decided to do something that I was supposed to do a long time ago, which is to surrender. And then I realized that there's a, the different levels of surrender. You know, it's just there's a Chaitanya Mahaprabhu level of surrender. <laughs> there's Advaita Charya's level. Of, there's a there's a Prabhupada level of surrender, and there's me level of surrender. And I have to accept the me level of surrender, which is you know in phases. So my first phase was, I promise you, Krishna that even if I had to sleep under the bridge tonight, I will never, ever, ever worry or think about my financial future from this moment on. I promise you, kill me if I break this promise. If I start worrying about my finances, give me some cancer that kills me in, in, in a week. I don't want to live like that anymore. It's horrible. It's not working. So I, I, I remember lifting my hands up in the air you know the Hiranya Kashipu uh, asana, which is not his asana to be. It's a it's a candle or something like that. You go on your you know on your toes. Of course, I couldn't do it like him completely, I'm like a ballerina on on the to on toes. <laughs> I'm not that advanced. I, I just like completely stretched out myself, my back and everything, and I I inhaled that idea of letting go from now on. I allow Krishna to do anything he wants with me. I'll die of hunger. I'll die of exposure. Uh, uh, of exposure. I'll die under a bridge. But I'm not going to worry myself anymore. So I let go of that huge expectation of life of, from Paramatma, from people around me. And I just became like, like liberated in the moment. All of the pain from my body. By the time I did this, there was no more pain. Nothing. In my lower back, I couldn't believe it. I was like struck with wonder. I'm not, this is not possible. I, I couldn't believe it because this was first experience. I wasn't pro in this. So for the next three days, I couldn't sleep. I, 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 I couldn't do anything. I was just like hysterical. I was waiting for my pain to come back. 
I'm like, okay, if this is real, then even my expectation of pain shouldn't bring it back because now I know what I did. And the pain didn't come back. <clears throat> the, the lower pain disappeared completely. The only thing I, I could feel is that there was pain there. You know, like you have a feeling that there was pain there, but now it's gone. I can. It was it was a dream, the dream inside the dream in the beautiful paradise dream. That's how I felt. Krishna gave me this amazing experience of self healing. It actually, wasn't self healing, but that's how it looks from the actually inside your mind. It looks like I did it. Of course, we know that Krishna has to censor everything and sanction everything. So he allowed me because I did the right thing. Of course, if this was the right thing, then anybody who does that should have similar results. And so in the next, you know, that was December, uh, by the time I came back to Croatia, which was June of 2008, I had half a year to prepare myself to go online and look for all the techniques that uh, talk about the things that I did inside myself. What I did was without any technique. I just decided to let go of everything, to accept my life exactly as it is. Not not like, all right, I'll accept you the way you are. No, no, I love you. I, uh, You know, like a little fanatic, like a, a flower children, children of the flowers, you know, completely different mentality. And I had to force it inside of myself. It just wasn't just going in, you know, the old fears, they want to come in and you go like, no, 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 no. I, had, I have arrangement with my Lord. No more worries. He's my manager, was always. He presents himself uh, as, as a supreme controller. So why am I worrying about anything, anywhere, anytime, about anyone? And so this is what I decided, nothing else. Uh, no more worries. And at that time, the pain was gone in like the matter of three minutes. The only thing that was left was 50% of my neck and pain, uh, neck and shoulder pain. And that pain was as such that for nine years, I couldn't turn my head at least to one direction all the way without feeling huge pain, like a big needle was stuck in my... I, people who listen to this, who, who have or had these problems, they're going to identify with every single word because everybody goes through this when you have these kind of problems, very similar pain structure, you know, and pain propagation. It, it's very, very similar and identifiable. So I realized that my lower back pain was not the same problem as my upper body pain that was connected to my relationship with my mother, women, you know, all these things in my head that I then took my time about six months to resolve in my head to let go of all the traumas, all the, all these things. I'm, I'm speeding up now. This is There's a lot of things to say about this. What do we need to do in our mind in order to actually release the trauma and then feel pain going away Bef before your eyes? You, you can actually feel it going away. It's amazing. You, you, you get like these, you know, like, how do you call it when you feel like, like bumps, you know? Yeah, pins and needs, <clears throat> exactly, as the oxygen starts flowing into those blood cells and blood cells are spreading it into those muscles and tissue and everything, you feel like like pipe has been opened and finally the water is coming through, like, finally you get oxygen in your body. Um, <clears throat> and so it took me about six months and I was completely pain free, you know, neck, everything. and. And I had this arrangement with Krishna. Anytime I don't notice the negative emotion that doesn't belong in my perception, please give me pain. I want pain. I want severe pain so that I know that I'm making a big mistake in my perception. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do wrong perception. It's a waste of life, a waste of time, waste of, oh my God, Krishna's resources. So that was the end of my life in America. I decided to turn around, go back to Croatia, because my then ex-wife always wanted to go, go back to Croatia. She wanted to go to America, but when she came to America, she realized that's not for her. I loved America. I still love America. Not the way it is now, now especially in, in the city where I lived. You know, I, I don't like liberal, uh, you know, government, democratic government, the way they, um, the way they uh, allow all these horrible things to happen. <clears throat> that we devotees don't like, you know. Um, I wouldn't want to come back there, but 
if it wasn't for that, I would love to be in America. I love American people. Oh, I love everything about America, you know, as a devotee. But that was the end of my <clears throat> life there. I decided to go back to Croatia and to spread this knowledge to devotees, which I knew they're suffering. There's so many, especially Sankitan devotees from my time, who are suffering from pain in the legs and feet and, and back. And I thought, my God, what points am I going to earn with Krishna if I go back and heal some of those Sankirtan devotees so that they can go out and preach, you know? Uh, so that was my plan, not to write a book, not to do seminars, just to go back and and just spread this knowledge, just give it to, devo to the devotees, you know? And also, I wanted to leave America because at that time, Obama came to the power and I saw Krishna told me, this is the most demonic president so far. Get out of here. He is not going to do, uh, you're not going to do well in America anymore. So I got that impulse, which I usually don't even provoke. I don't believe in my own emotions, you know, that I would listen to them, especially big decisions. I need counsel of many devotees, not just my feelings. But this was different, you know, like, get out of here. So, and that was just that financial crisis started then. And so it was a great move. Oh, my God. I loved that I moved to America in 99. And I loved that I moved to Croatia, back to Croatia, uh, nine years later, uh, in 2008. So I came to Croatia and I offered my services to devotees from the, through their website. And one Mataji came. She barely, she was barely able to drag her feet to my apartment. She was all in pain, rheumatism, you know, and all these things, you know, back, bones, everything. She was uh, depressed like that and, you know, in not very, not in very good condition. And I was fresh from my own healing, you know, and all these six months of researching internet. And I found EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique, which was closest to the explanation of what I did to myself in order to, to uh, open up the blood in my, in my, uh, in my, um, the oxygen in my blood and to heal my body. NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, Louise Hay, she was wonderful. She still is, I mean, her instructions. Um, and uh, self-hypnosis, hypnosis, you know, stuff like that. That, uh, But not every teacher. Some teachers, they were really, you know, explaining it in a Vedic way that I could totally agree and identify with things that I did in myself. So I collected some of these techniques and I thought, I'm going to present this to devotees because I don't know if I can really copy-paste what I did at that moment when I healed myself <laughs> There's a lot of explanation of what I did in that one minute. I could talk for days and hours, you know, to make sure that people understand exactly what they need to do. If you try to let go of your emotions in order in order to uh, get rid of the pain, you're not going to do anything. It's like I'm going to be unattached to results so I can get results. Doesn't work. Krishna recognizes that. The detachment has to be genuine. And so somebody has to explain to us, how, how do you become genuinely um, detached without, um, without expecting results of that detachment? Okay, I don't want to get healed. I accept everything. Where's the, where's the healing now? <laughs> well, that doesn't work. You know, it, it has to be genuine. It has to be authentic. So I talked to her for about three hours in order to explain everything. By the time we were done, she was flying down the stairs. She was singing and flying and couldn't stop talking about her experience with me. And so many devotees started coming to me and I just had results and results and results. I thought if this was just my karma to heal myself at this time, because this could be it. What if that's your karma? And now you're trying to sell something, you know, to everybody, but that's not everybody's karma. So, uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. So if it is not just karma, if it's a genuine law of nature that God, you know, Krishna provides to everyone. I'm not envious to anyone. If a demon uses the law of nature, he will get the results that are promised by such action. <clears throat> and so I thought it has to be above karma. 
It cannot be just, you know, I want to get healed. You cannot do it from the point of the body. You have to do it from the point of Atma, of the soul. You have to think like a soul in order to control your body, in order to influence your body. Otherwise, if you think like a body, your body influences you. And then you're constantly in this loop, because I'm body, body influences me, and because body influences me, I think more like a body, and then blah, 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 blah in the circle. So that, that was like a, also a point of pressure, you know. Before, as a devotee, you expect that chanting and service in due course of time will bring about, you know, superior consciousness. No, it doesn't really. Well, you know, I, I'm not going to say no, it didn't work for me because my chanting was useless. <laughs> so I couldn't expect that my chanting is going to bring about such huge change. It was more like a mercy case. I hope Krishna will reward me with devotional service in due course of time even though even though such sentence didn't make much sense to me i knew i had to do something not to really deserve but to kind of earn krishna's trust and to get credited by some level of perception so that i can do more service you know without becoming um puffed up too much and and and, and strayed on, on, onto different road because krishna gave you some power now you're gonna do stupid things you know as it happens <laughs> a lot of time so i try to avoid that <clears throat> by giving devotees the knowledge for free and for the nation you know brahminical i decided no more earning money no more prices no more calculations whatever krishna gives me through donations you know through people i will accept that <clears throat> and if I have to go hungry, I'll go hungry. I won't, I won't think about it anymore. Of course, people like it, you know. Everybody's charging, especially for healing. They charge a lot of money for therapies, for uh, uh, talking, you know, to people. I didn't. So uh, the, the word got out quickly. And then, you know, family of devotees who are not devotees, they were also, you know, sent to me. And then their friends and their friends and... In a matter of like a month, somebody told me, you need to do seminar. You need to do, you know, lectures. I'm like, I didn't plan to do this, but okay. So I put down, you know, what I talked to people. I had to talk to them for like three hours to explain how I did my technique. And and they told me, you, you need to write this down. I'm like, it looks like I'm going to have to. And so I wrote my first book. And I wrote my second book, all because I had to do seminars and to prepare a seminar, you need to put it down on paper. And then I realized, okay, this is for seminar, but I have to expand each chapter more and more. I need to write a book. So I wrote my book. This is my first book. Wow. Thank you for sharing. Look at that. Yeah. It's a small book. Is, is that you on it, the front? It's, yeah, that's me. I didn't want to have any copyright infringements in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I put, I thought, you know, people are going to say, oh, you put yourself there. Well, you know, if I put anything else, somebody can sue me later on. And I'm not into that. I don't have the money to fight. This is my second book. Basically, this this is one book, part one and part two. It's called Samo Zdravljenje, which means self-healing. <coughs> and... Um, I put down all, everything that I was talking on my seminars. I would write it down. And within three months, I wrote the first book. And it also took me about a month or two to write the second book because I had everything in my head. I, I just had to put it down. And from then on, it just, you know, <laughs> it jumped up. You know, people called me everywhere to do seminars um, from 2009. I started in 2009. It's amazing. It's, it's yeah. really amazing, actually. I mean, what I've loved about our dialogue today is that I asked you the first question and you've just shared That's everything <laughs> with me. It's wonderful. And I've just sat back and relaxed. And it's I think only one of the podcasts in three years has this happened where I've just sat back and relaxed. And you've because sometimes you interview somebody and they really have to be, you know, like, can you I have to kind of try and get information out of them. But you're so passionate about what you do. You're so enthusiastic about whether it's kind of Harinams or Krishna consciousness, how you came to the movement or, or you know, self-healing. It's It's been great. And it's, it's almost as if you memorized all the questions I was going to ask you. And, <laughs> and, and it's it's been absolutely fantastic. I mean, I'm so in terms of now, uh, in terms of a on a full time basis, are you running workshops and writing books and, and running seminars? Is that what you do if, like, for a living? For a living, yeah, Brahminical type of living, 
which means uh, I'm giving out knowledge and receiving whatever people give me. I mean, you can read it on my YouTube, in, it's in Croatian. If you like these videos, please support my work. And then there's a link on my website that I explain how to support my work so that people understand that I don't earn money. I can never accept any uh, regular pay, you know, like a salary. Um, and also I am uh, as a bra I'm, I don't consider myself Brahmana. I just do Brahminical work. And as such, until Krishna gives me some other service, I have to do it Brahminically. I mean, I want to do it really Brahminically. And I have to have in front of me a project that is more important than me or even my personal work. And this is the second part of my activity, which is the Varnashrama farms right uh the, that finally we have a whole story we have preaching on the streets we have uh temple uh temples right iskon temples where you can go and become a devotee and get trained and then what go back to the material world and go back to studying and working it's it's not a finished story i i thought that Prabhupada gave us all three compo components, preaching outside and then training in the temple and then living on the farm. And if somebody wants to go back and live on the city, then you should have a really good reason, like preaching in those centers in the city, you know, bringing people in and then taking, the, you know, training them to become devotees, to learn how to chant and do sadhana. And then if they're good preachers, keep them in the city, but they also have to go to the farm to learn how to live there, to learn how to, you know, care for the cows and horses and, and, and land and, and plants and food and, you know, for six months and then go back to the city to preach and be in the, you know, passionate and tamastic, you know, atmosphere of the city, bringing out people. And then again, go back to Nebuchadnezzar or Zion, you know, to, <laughs> you know, like from the Matrix. This is a very similar concept, you know, they're preachers, they go out, they, 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 uh, they bring people out of the matrix and then they go back to, you know, uh, charge their batteries to, to associate with people in their city, the real people, you know, who are not plugged in. It's, 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 and then you can do that forever. I mean, if Krishna gives me 10,000 years, yeah, that's, that's a, the only thing I want to do. So uh, when I came back to Croatia from America, besides offering self-healing, you know, knowledge to devotees, I also put up the ad, an ad that I'm looking for someone who wants to live on a farm, you know, village life. And immediately some devotees you know, called me and say, hey, we actually are talking about this for the past few years. Let's get together and see what's going on. And, um, and, and so I found this devotee, Ati Chandra Chaitanya Prabhu, and his good wife, Sarvanga Sundari Mataji. Um, they wanted to, you know, they had some little money they, they saved up. They said, you know, we were thinking either we're going to buy an apartment in the city and then stay here. He also had a good job, a police officer, special forces, police. So that's, a you know, good pay and good benefits later on. It's not something you give up. <laughs> you push on until you get such a, a retirement that you can really live nicely even in the city. Uh, but uh, he was ready to give all that up and to go to retire the earliest possible at the age of 41 which, which would give him like this minimal minimal benefits that wouldn't even allow you to live on the village just paying you know your but he was ready to sacrifice that and the money because uh, when we got together in 2008 when i came back from america i met with them we had completely same idea how the life should be on the farm you know varnashrama and all these things what principles we should and then the next like six months we were talking so much like three or four families and we basically you know got uh, got the uh, feeling that we agree in everything you know how it should be all the mistakes that iskon has made in the past on the farms in the temples in the big community small communities let's not do those let's try to make principles such that anybody can live there even if they're not a devotee but you know without killing animals without poisoning the land without exploiting people we had three major principles that we established in our statutes so to speak um first is um uh, there is uh, you cannot exploit the land 
people or animals. There's no exploitation. So whatever we do, we have to make make sure that it's not 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 exploiting. You know, uh, doing cash crops, you know, and destroying the land just to make money. No, no, I want Krishna to give me money in some other way. This is exploitation. I'm going to get bumped down in due course of time if I do this, you know, what other people usually do for money. Uh, we also decided we're not going to take money from U EU funds or government funds or some unknown corporation donations, nothing, no impure things like that. We wouldn't take big money from criminal corporations. So we just depended on donations from people and whatever we can inspire people to, you know, to give. That's the cleanest money and the best money, you know, that we can get for our farm, which is... So we found the land. We It wasn't easy to find the land in Croatia because good lands are mostly full of minefields. You see, that's the problem in Croatia. There are parts of Croatia that are just beautiful. Forests and hills and mountains and minefields. And and there was there was a horrible reality, but we managed to find in the place where there were, there were no minefields, there was very little fighting, so no, no 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 mass killings and you know bad karma and stuff like that. Beautiful area, rolling hills. It looks like many parts of of, uh, of England. You know, rolling hills, not big hills, just little rolling hills and little valleys. Yeah, that's it. I love England. I love England, those parts that are like that. I would love to live there and farm and, you know, why the Vikings came. I mean, Vikings came, they saw your land and said, we are not living here. This is a great place, you know. So, yeah, a very similar atmosphere. There's, 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 I have photos that you can also I can share with you. Um, we found the land and we spent all of his... Uh, savings that he had it was 40,000 euros at that time it was much more than now 40,000 euros it was 2009 and we bought that land it was 17 and a half uh, hectares that's almost double the acres uh, you know what hectare is it's uh, so 175,000 square meters of, of land pristine land uh, nobody did anything on, on those lands for 40 years because people were moving out Almost nobody around us. It's just few people. They're also ready to move out or to die. You know, they're old. So we came there. We bought the land. We made friends with locals. Uh, they helped us uh, dig wells. We dig two wells there. We we uh, we plowed the land. We we planted uh, many things without even living there. We were traveling for two and a half hours from Zagreb to go there to pay our neighbor there. To work on our land so 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 we can see is this good position for us to escape to you know uh if there's a war if there's a huge crisis or you just if we want to go and live there you know create a community mm -hmm. and the land was just you can spit on it and something would grow it was beautiful it is <laughs> not was it but at that time it was just to us like this is it so we bought the land and for the from 2010 to 2015 we were preparing it and then the first family the police uh, guy the police devotee he um, quit the job and went to earlier retirement and uh, he moved there in 2016 we actually built a house the first house they moved in they started living then we built a second house all from our money just my my, my current wife my second wife She's a yoga teacher, a devotee, and we together, we do these workshops, seminars, uh, retreats on on the islands of Croatia. And, and this is how we, you know, collect money, make money. And basically, we just live in this rented apartment in Zagreb. We have two old cars that we use for our service, and all the money just goes into the farm. We have two cows. Um, the place uh, we have like two huts as well so that m more people can come and the next project is to build actually my our house for myself and my wife my wife so that we can move there that's probably take a few more years they're also building a a, a free a freeway to there it's going to be instead of two and a half hours maybe one and a half hour to get there which is nothing so this is what we're doing now basically preaching all over bosnia serbia croatia slovenia uh, I'm doing separate preaching than my wife. She she has yoga studio, so she's pretty much here in Zagreb, busy all day long with workshops and everything. I also I'm one of the teachers, yoga teachers, but not for asanas, just for theory, Vedic theory. 
So if you want to become a teacher, uh, you have to uh, go through a teacher training program uh, for uh, yoga teachers. And I'm one of the teachers for the teachers, you know, that give uh, I give them the basic Vedic knowledge, you know, the modes of nature, the karma, reincarnation, all these things that they have to know to become yoga teachers so they can teach their students. So they don't have just any yoga teacher. They have a devotee yoga teacher, you know, is contrained. So it's, it's, it's a great opportunity and it's a big yoga center, a yoga studio, a lot of people coming there. So and my uh, club Super Soul that I have is part of that yoga studio. It's a separate like a, a room that people come in and I do two lectures a week, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, and the rest of the time I'm traveling to Rijeka. I'm still going to Rijeka. I cannot avoid that city. Uh, actually, it's a wonderful city. Um, Slovenia, all over Croatia. And now I'm going to Sarajevo next month. Um, I go to Belgrade as well. Wherever people call me, I don't... You see, I never advertise myself for one day. I have my website, you know, but I never, never do programs for myself. Somebody else has to call me. I don't organize seminars for myself, except in my club, which is, you know, mine. I can do it anytime I want. And that's great. But that's just in Zagreb. Um, the rest of it, whenever people call me. So, so this is uh, my story. Uh, ever since I healed my back, I never had problems again. I had problems two times um, for three days because I was putting together IKEA furniture. And you know how that goes, you know, you bend down and you get up uh, all of a sudden. A real pain lasts for a day or two or three or maybe a, 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 a week, but it doesn't come back all the time. And I also realize anytime, even if I do some, something physical and something, I, I feel some pain, it's always emotional. I always look for, you know, inside, okay, get rested, you know, lay down or sit down. But it's actually, it's all this emotion. Now, that emotional story, I think that should be a whole different podcast because it takes a long time to go through these details. How, what, what do you do actually inside your mind, inside your perception to, to uh, con convert that pain into not really pleasure, but just peace and joy? Not pleasure. Pleasure is disturbing, but peace and joy, that's what, that's what's, that's the real price. Um, I had a couple of questions. One of them was, if people watching this podcast um, want to find out more about the farm, how do they do that? Is there a website or a Facebook page somewhere? Um, for the farm, not really, not yet, because we have nothing really to show. To show for uh, there's a house people live there children are playing outside we have a dog outside we have cows we we have reg we have one volunteer uh, uh living there in one of the huts we had more of them in, in the past living there for a month for two for three for a few days you know so volunteers they can come if there's work when there's work um they can contact me. It's the best way. I, I don't have anything on English. I have one um, drone footage of the farm, you know, from the top, from the house. So you can see how it looks there. It's on my channel. So you can type in drone farm. Um, uh, they can call me and then I talk to them. Maybe it's not the time to come to the farm at all. Yeah, because, you know, there's nothing to do. You can come visit anytime. We go there from Zagreb. We go there to, uh, once a month. I bring all of my congregation, you know, to the farm. Uh, we were there yesterday, actually. Uh, we go in the morning and then uh, around three o'clock we start, you know, with bhajans and and lecture and prashadam. We walk around the, the property to show to people who are there for the first time. We talk about our plans for the future. We want to have, my dream is to, my vision, not dream, but vision is to have their, you know, the usual stuff, Vedic Academy, you know, uh, and to allow other, um, other uh, uh, religions, Vedic religions to live there as long as they're vegetarian. So 
you cannot exploit and exploiting mean, means killing and killing animals is exploitation i will kill a cow if that's the only way we can survive the voters know that line i mean i will eat a cow if that's the only way we're going to survive because it's there's more sin in killing a human being by starvation than killing a cow <laughs> you know it, it is human beings are still more important than cows but <laughs> for that occasion to arise i mean we really have to be in a horrible 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 situation so i tell people yeah even if you're christian if you're muslim as long as you don't kill animals you don't exploit people and the land that's the first principle that you have to accept the second principle is that you cannot work outside of the farm you cannot work for corporation and live there because you're dependent on the system then and you're their slave you're their puppet you're going to do whatever they want and so we cannot really count on you when we have to do farm work and you have to uh, you know you do your own thing you're not really part of the community and so if you really want to live there full time on our property of course you can buy your own your own property there you know that's on sale and do whatever you want but as far as living on our land because we bought uh, five more hectares so we, now we have 22 23 hectares of land and uh, it's a lot of land we can build a lot of houses completely on one land and it's our rule whatever we decide it's 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 legal there it's legal you know and we can uh, accept or not accept people who are not willing to, uh, you know, follow that. So the second rule is, uh, you know, we depend on each other. That's the only way we're going to survive. We depend financially on each other. And the third rule is there's no promiscuous behavior. And, and those three rules are very general. So when you break them down, what does that mean? That means everything that we're following, except I don't care if you're ISKCON, if you're Sai Baba, if you're Shivaist. In the Vedic culture, there's room for everybody. I want to see those temples everywhere. I want to see a temple every 50 meters. I saw that in India, and I love it. Small temples, you know, uh, like little chapels, you know, built. Christ Christians do that everywhere. There's a chapel, especially in Croatia. You, you go in the, in the forest on an off-road somewhere, and there's a chapel in the middle of the forest. Somebody built it there. It's wonderful. I love it. So, yeah, we have that, th those principles. Um, we want to build a school for children. We want to build an academy. We, we want to build hospice. You know, everything that the community needs. Uh, but we want to do it in a way that is not rushed. Quickly, quickly. We need a lot of money, a lot of construction, and then politics, corruption, bad actors, bad, bad agents, you know, come in because they see a lot of resources. When they come to our farm, they see, oh, you have to work here in order to, to make something happen. And most people say, yeah, I would like to go somewhere where there's already everything set up. And I tell them, but you're going to be a guest there always. Why don't you stay here and build everything from the ground up, become close to people that, that you know, that live there. And that's going to be a real home. But everybody wants to have options. You know, everybody wants to, you know, have divorce paper, you know, already ready in case of, you know, something happens. Uh, what we did, and this is the most important part, I think, uh, uh, with this farm thing. Ati Chandra Chaitanya Prabhu and I, we decided, and his wife, uh, his amazing wife that agreed to something like this. Um, not just that he retires uh, sooner and then they basically couldn't live. If I quit this deal, this uh, community, they financially couldn't survive. He would have to get work. <laughs> financially, they couldn't. They had. They have three children, and uh, so it was. Um, it was a big, big investment into our own self. You know, into our own relationship. So basically. Um, he invested with his own money to buy the land and I invested all the money that I earned so far into, you know. Meanwhile, he got some more money from his father, uh, di his mother died actually. And then there was a small apartment, we sold that and then invested in. So basically now we are a couple of hundred euros, a couple of hundred thousand euros each invested in the farm. We don't, we have no receipts. We we keep track of nothing like that. We just know that we put everything in it, and we're both up to here in investment, and not debt. We have no debt. 
nothing no not a penny of that um we live free but we invested so much into each other that there's absolutely no way we can quit each other we're completely like two arms we cannot quit. we're like family you know now he lives there since 2016 i'm sending him money so that they can live you know that little pension they have that's just to cover basic expenses but anything more than that you know they need more money uh, uh what to speak about building so we built two houses you know how much money is that anywhere you go that's a lot of money so krishna was kind he sent uh, many people who gave bigger donations you know 10 20 000 euros because they saw what we we're doing uh and they wanted to see this farm you know flourish so that they can have also a place to crash to uh, to come and maybe live uh, and do festivals and stuff like that <clears throat> so yeah we managed to build two houses two um, huts uh, nice huts you know like living huts uh, we 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 have our own food we had our own milk and cheese for a few years until cow uh, she was too old uh, and so yeah people can call us uh, can call me directly and if they have any questions you know details about what's going on there if they want to help somehow or just come and see oh yeah please come and see we are now decorating this second house that I was telling you about to be to, so we can rent it out on Airbnb and booking you know so that people come and uh, we can get some money from there and build other projects because you know the, when you have a lot of land no amount of money is impressive to you somebody comes and say i'll give you a million euros i go like okay i'll spend it in two days because just to put a fence around a huge property this is a tens of thousands of euros just go up in flames like nothing just the fence what to speak about serious things you know building it's a million euros that's like three projects done three buildings and maybe some here and there and money goes away quickly there so yeah we're basically working hard my wife and i um so that uh, they can live there and they can actually produce something and build something extra so one day when we come there we have oh no we have um everything we need to live independently of the of the city and the system and that's what we want to do we want to live independently produce our own food work only on the on the land um and maybe sell some of the the extra we have but money is not a problem with it really with us if we build everything we don't need to earn so much money because everything is ours the heating is ours a little bit of electricity if they turn that off oh i'll be happy to use beeswax to make candles and to live like that to go to bed at 9 30 you know i lived like that in the temple even in summer when it was light outside we got to bed like oh my god yeah you can live like that if you get up early in the morning you don't need electricity so much <laughs> you don't need it at all but i know some people cannot even hear that they go like i don't, don't want to hear that without electricity that's horrible <clears throat> actually that's a real life because then we gather outside build a fire play music laugh stories you know children we do shows and dramas and because there's no electricity there's no internet we have to entertain ourselves and then great ideas come about like we used to in the 80s uh, uh, we had to be outside all the time you know even some some of us had computers but that was like low class you know for for when it's rain outside then you'd play computer games in the 80s but otherwise you're outside so yeah i want to bring that back you know especially this young generation is oof, doesn't look very good i mean they're completely addicted to to virtual reality which which means to reality that doesn't exist it's it's, it's creating psychotic people and um, just spending one month on the farm like that just touching animals and looking at the am animals every day and happy people heals you up completely so basically that's that's my story without too many details that's that's you know when i read your questions I, I quickly read your questions i'm like well i'll just go chronologically because i remember m my years and dates really well so, some people don't they go like i'm not sure if they, i know exactly which month where it, it's all in my head well i have to say for me personally and i, I hope for others it's been wonderful to hear your story uh, it, you. it, it's so detailed and um interesting to hear and you've you've lived a very fulfilling life until now and i hope it's even more fulfilling in the future that you're really someone who's trying to serve 
Srila Prabhupada trying to serve Lord Krishna. And I hope at I hope at some point in the future I will be at that same level as you in terms of being able to surrender. You know, uh, I mean, it's I'm a lot better than I was years ago. Um, yes, because, because those division, are the levels. Yeah, but I'd like to be even more surrendered. I still worry about things, little things, and I wish that I wouldn't w worry about them. I need to have Shraddha, faith in the Lord, yes. that he is going to look after me. Everything's going to be fine. And no, I, let me correct you, please. Not everything is going to be fine. Everything is fine. He is, is fine. looking for you. Yes, it, <laughs> it's such a trick. Go. It's a perception trick. That's one of the things that I, when I talk to people, I notice how they talk. I'm like, yep, you're totally in a different time zone. You have to be here and say, no, no, he is doing that. So because he's doing that, how do you feel about it? So you go like, okay, if he's doing that, if I believe he's doing that all the time, I should be happy all the time and thankful. And that's one of the things I became so thankful and grateful and always thanking for everything, even even so-called bad things, like the things that aren't going according to my plan. I go like, no, 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 this is from my Lord. This is all sweet. And then it turns to sweet when you think like that. Krishna just turns the arrangement around and shows you all you have to do. And throughout the whole Bhagavad Gita, Oh, the list of things Krishna wants us to do, just love me, trust me, let me lead you. That's it. Is that job? Is that a job description? No, that's a description of a lazy person enjoying on Hawaii's. Like when you do what Krishna says, you're, you're enjoying in a major way. Enjoying, but differently. You don't want to enjoy, but Krishna then forces you into this bliss and this peaceful state that you can see his arrangements all around you. You cannot be stupid anymore to be afraid because it's every day. Every day there's a proof. So yeah, that's that's my life. Far away from real surrender, you know, Prabhu, uh, thank you for your uh, encouragement. But um, I, I, I just, I instead of, you know, pretending to be advanced and all that, I'll, I just admit that I'm stupid and Krishna is taking care of stupid people and drunk. I'm not drunk, but I'm stupid. So Krishna is taking care of me and I'm so happy that he's doing that, that I want to share that to other people. You feel stupid? Good. Surrender to Krishna. You feel fallen? Good. Surrender. But, uh, but we heard this word surrendered so many times and we go like, yes, yes, surrender. But we don't really know what that means. You know, we don't really do that because if we stop worrying about money and all these the health then we think oh but then krishna has to serve me so i have to worry that's a completely wrong concept krishna is serving you already you think you're gonna ever take control of your body of your body fluids and pressures and temperature never that's all krishna is doing what about your memory how, how it's serving you when i'm speaking now how the words are coming that's all krishna do i mean he, he's fulfilling my desire but he's serving me all the time so why am i pretending that all of a sudden i'm going to take over all these no no there are specific services that krishna wants us to do take this knowledge and spread it out the rest of it the rest of it is not up to you stop it stop meddling this is how i heard from krishna stop meddling in my business and I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so stupid. And then and then every day trying to let go of that desire to go back into, but I also have to do, I also have to worry because if I don't worry, everything is going to go to hell. No, 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 no. Yes. It could be Prabhu. We've, we've been um, talking for almost two hours really yeah <laughs> believe it or not it's um it's been a wonderful um dialogue today i've loved just sitting here and listening to your story um it, it's been a really good podcast to produce with you um what i want to do uh, with this podcast is i will put links to your website even though it's i think croatian i still want to put a link to your website maybe we can provide your contact details uh so devotees from wherever they are in the world can get in touch with you directly to ask you any question they want or, or you know seek help with something but it's been yes. a real um joy for me today to 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 hear your story i find it very encouraging very inspiring because some of the podcasts that i produce are quite negative <laughs> about right. controversial issues and it's been it's been a real change for me to just feel so po i mean I, I always am positive i think but i've 
we're finishing on a really positive note today and it's been absolutely wonderful um so i really appreciate your time um i'm going to say goodbye to the viewers at home uh and then you and i can have a very brief debrief after um but a big thank you to um uh kukudmi prabhu for being our 110th guest uh, I'm not sure if there's anything significant in the number 110, but to thank him for being the 110th guest um, on the Hare Krishna Project podcast. Don't forget, if you're watching this on YouTube, to if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. And whenever I say that, it does work because the number of subscribers increases. Please hit the subscribe button so you can keep updated about future podcasts. Um, and if you're watching this on Facebook, please do like or follow the Harry Christian Project Facebook page. So you can be kept updated about um, future podcasts and productions from the Harry Christian Project. So until next week, I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.